It's for the maze. I'm gonna. No, that's good. You can pick it up. In the, not in the, you're not in it. second hour we'll hear from your, you guys and have a much more interactive session. Feel free to ask Peter questions if anything isn't clear. But I think a lot of the experiences that he talks about in the first hour we can pick up on and discuss as well as talking about how you guys have got on this week or what you're planning on getting up to in the next week in, in recording the people uh, for this project. Uh, and indeed if any of you have brought in any recordings and you'd like to play some of those we will have time to do that as well. And that's it. Nothing else to say. This is a fire jump at the window. Uh, <laughs> right, over to you. Peter, can you give a round of applause for the Peter the Sound Kitchen Project, please? Um, I might just sit here rather than standing there, if that's right. Can you hear me at the back? Yep. Yeah, okay, yeah. great. Thank you, James, and the Sound Kitchen Collective and the Ladies Language Archive for having me. Um, I went to the conference, the Song Collectors Collective conference. Yeah, um, we, we regret calling it that. <laughs> I went to the conference last year, and you know, having spent the last few years doing field recordings in a formal conference, it was really energising, exciting to be in a room full of people who were all, you know, up for getting out there recording stuff. So this, I imagine, is more so. So it's great to be. Here. Um, I've got some. This projector is going to shut down every ten minutes, so you just bear with us. Um, I've got, um, over the next hour and thereabouts, I'd like to talk about some of my experiences working in the field of broadcast um, and how I think some of what we do today is informed by the history of field recording practice and um, some things to think about as, the, as you go out there and move forward and I go out to my research. Um, so, just a little bit about me. Um, that was our lady before, Mrs. Marley. Um, that's me recording a car radio. <laughs> Um, I'm not really sure what qualifies someone to be a field recordist. If you look back, Cecil Sharp had musical parents, but he started off as a clerk in the Bank of South Australia. Um, Jean Jenkins, she did the proper way. She was an anthropologist and did study musicology in Missouri, and that was a bit in union politics. Um, and before coming on to study here at SOAS and working at the Women's Museum. Um, and apart from having a very famous field recording father, um, it was still dabbling in um, radical politics and other themes too. 
um, and about pneumonia that saw a 17 year old Alan Lomax um, break from Harvard and go on to do the early value of con Congress trips um, and that those ones that brought their belly out into the world. So, um, my route of film recording is through stories. Um, I'm woefully underqualified, I'm a terrible violinist, I'm a just about qualified historian. So it's through being a radio producer that has got me dabbling with microphones and it's given me the opportunity to go and do the bulk of my field work. So that's where I am. Uh, the last 10 years I've been a producer of BBC Radio 3, um, working across programmes such as Late Junction, Here and Now, World on 3, World Roots, and, um, and I've recorded an enormous amount of music in this country of visiting musicians from Ali Bakatore to Georgian choirs to, you know, in the Opera House, everything, um, Scottish fiddlers. Um, and then I've had the opportunity to plan, conceive, and go on quite involved field recording trips um, in very different places. World Roots, if you don't know it, um, was until it was rather surprisingly cold from the schedule last year, um, presented by Lucy Durant, who's one of the staff here. Um, and so actually, it's all still available online, so, so that's right. uh, there's an archive of all of the recordings um, that you can listen to during the a little known fact that it all exists. So, um, um, the work is collecting traditional music around the world, so it's performed in context and then pieced together for a radio audience. Um, and we collected the sounds and the stories and the music of a place because they're endangered partly, because they're marginalised sometimes, um, or just because they're interesting. Um, it fits for me neatly in fact really an ideal uh, of service broadcasting of educating, entertaining and informing. Um, and the programme and its team of producers visited 50 countries, um, sadly not me on all of them, but, um, and some more than once, and then made broadcast quality recordings of traditional music in those locations. And it, the, the ones that stick in my mind are Albania, Equatorial Guinea, um, the Appalachian Mountains, uh, Mali, Argentina, Sri Lanka. Um, so I'll be telling you some, some stories around what, what I did in those countries. Okay, next question. Um, but I just kind of want to start with with how I relate to sound, because for me, a lot of this process is also about listening, um, and, and me as the as a recorder, being a listener as well as being a recorder, um, and I think you know collecting this collecting sound is a process of discovery, but also of preservation, um, and sometimes I think of it as wanting to control an unruly environment, or to catalogue my experiences, or to revisit those kind of transcendent moments. Um, and on some level, I think it's also underpinned by that need to own and to possess the fleeting and ephemeral experience. Um, so I collect sounds professionally, but also in a personal capacity. Um, the sounds I collect for myself uh, are things that just caught my ear, things that you know I don't want to escape, um, things that are it's sometimes a way of passing time. You know, you get a microphone out, you put on the headphones, and the world is a completely different place. Um, so just an example. Um, sorry for the vegetarians. <laughs> This is in Japan. Um, you know what that is, David. Um, that was a, a small countryside supermarket in Japan. I can't remember exactly where it was, near a hot spring resort, um, and above a fridge full of meat, like that. Um, there's this dusty table recorder on top of the fridge, and that was an advert for the for Shabu Shabu, which is a very thinly sliced beef that you eat. Um, and uh, the tape, you could hear the tape was on its last leg, you could hear it kind of the wow and the flutter as it gone out. So this tape had been playing in the supermarket possibly for decades, advertising Shabu Shabu. It's not traditional music, um, but it's definitely part of the cultural narrative. And if you've been to Japan and been to rural Japan, that kind of uh, food-based singing advertising is really important. Shabu Shabu is also quite good. So, um, but these, these, I think I play you this because these personal recordings are really observational. Um, the world happens around me, and then passively I just record. I plug my microphone into mine. I've captured it, possessed, um, and I file it away. Probably forgotten because I have a terrible hard drive. Um, but Chrissy, without the memories, my memories, they're fairly contextless, this, these sounds. Um, they float free of the metadata of stories, and you can make up your own mind about them if you want to hear them. Um, but 
be the activate that hidden error. Um, but in contrast to those recordings, the stuff I do as a radio producer is I collect sounds to construct narratives for other people. Um, so I, I intervene in situations and I create opportunities to collect, and then I piece them together to tell stories. Um, and the end destination for each sound I collect has a direct effect on the, the moment of collection. Um, so I'm not a passive observer anymore. Uh, it's, it's the act of collecting ruptures the life of the sounds I'm collecting. So I think this is a really important way of thinking about um, sound collecting for me, is that, that these sounds are happening around us, and when we, when we turn up in a place and intervene, just like the projector is in my... What do I have to do? Often I'll press the uh, okay. projector parallel and then it should boot up again and then die in 10 minutes again. Keeps me on my toes. Um, yeah, this, this, this idea of, um, of, of pressing, pressing record is creating a new chain of events. Um, if, I'll talk about it a bit in a minute. If you're somewhere where um, people are used to be recording, they know, they know what they're doing when you ask them to perform. If you're in a place where traditions are still passed orally, um, and you're trying to set up a recording to make a broadcast quality recording of it, that's a very strong intervention. And just your, your very being there wanting to collect that thing creates, uh, changes the frame within that music. Um, it's not always uh, a bad thing. It sounds, sounds very serious. Like it's almost, uh, let's see if I can still play with this. And here's an example of when it can be fun. by the isopolyphonic group up here on the map. Oh, I'm just being offered some raki by the isopolyphonic group up here on the mountain of Girokastra and uh, it is 10.30 a.m. and they're now on their second round. So it just seems like raki accompanies everything here. Yes. Especially music. Music and Raki, they go together. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Polyphony without Raki is, it can't work. The songs would not flow otherwise. <laughs> okay, in that case, Gezuar. Hi, the Gezuar. That was on a, a mountainside in um, Albania, in, in the town of Jurakastra. Um, and these are two of the eight men who gathered to sing. Um, uh, a really ancient polyphonic tradition, I saw it. Um, and they drink an awful lot. It was 10 in the morning. Um, and we'd, we'd been there from 9 a.m. The first thing that happened was that um, a bottle of raki came out of the table, the local kind of of spirit, and some spring onions. Which was, um, <laughs> good for the um, but um, there were only seven men there when we started, and we were waiting for the eighth guy. And you know, when, if you've done any field work, you'll know that you always wait for somebody who's always late, and it you know, goes on and on and on. And then this guy turned up in a police car. Um, it turned out he was a policeman, so that was okay. But uh, he gets out of the car and he sits under there and we're thinking, okay, the rest of the guys are really wasted and it's kind of 10 in the morning already. And uh, they offered him some raki and he said, no, 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 no. He turned around and said, look, I can't do the raki. I'm uh, driving the police car behind the fire engine to make sure the fire is on duty. So he wouldn't turn his phone off. And then he promptly ordered a pint of red wine. That's how they <laughs> it's a fun place. Um, you've probably all seen this photo before. But I just want to touch a little bit on, on the history. Um, this probably isn't comprehensive, but um, I'll give it a go. Um, this is how I see, because World Roots was by no means the first, you know, first broadcast medium for the tradition. Um, it's been possibly the, one of the last to do it on a formal broadcast scale, which I think is a real shame. Um, but field recordings you know, work has been carried out by broadcasters, journalists, musicologists, anthropologists, acoustic ecologists um, over the years, um, since the 19th century. Um, Cecil Sharp, Dean Jenkins, Adam Lomax, Hugh Tracy, these are you know, names that you probably know. Um, and those collections are on wax cylinders, they're on Shanak, they're on, on magnets and tape, um, and then a lot of them are digitized in our um, And we're digging into the ones that you haven't already dug into. Um, Early pioneers, uh, this is Francis Denton in 1916, back the chief mountain chief in the States. Um, early pioneers came from, uh, actually, there's a, there's a dual development between ornithological researchers and, 
and other colleges who are using the Waxen, Edison Waxen the technology, um, so sort of cool. um, The first, apparently, is Ludwig Koch in Germany. He was an eight-year-old who got given a wax cylinder recorder, and he recorded the bird, and the light around the shell. Um, Cornell University were doing the same, they were driving huge vans out in the countryside to record birds. Um, Carl Weichmann was doing the same thing. Um, and then that technology was also being used by musicologists. So it's 1889 for the bird song, and then Jesse Walter Fuchs was uh, uh, recording the Zulu and Hopi people sort of early in 1890. Uh, so that's kind of where this mechanical field recording starts. Uh, 1898, Alfred Courthandle went to the Torres Straits between Australia and New Guinea to record uh, music there, and that's in the British Library Sound as well, so you can hear that before. Um, 1907, John Lomax, Alan Lomax's father, was recording cowboy songs on wax cylinder as well. So this is a kind of it's an interesting, it's an interesting historical juncture. Um, Carl Ludwig Koch, the guy who made the bird song, um, knew Liszt and Brahms. So there's this weird point where history and technology is meeting things. Um, Cecil Sharp, who you probably know, and I think uh, Steve Rams will talk a bit more about later on in this series, um, was mostly collecting by hand. Um, he collected his first song in 1903 from his gardener to see the lovely, he was 44, so he was quite late, uh, the age of um, And then after World War One, he ended up in the Southern Appalachian Mountains. Um, he wrote this, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, Instead of having to combine my attention to the aged as in England, where no one under the age of 70 ordinarily possesses the folk song tradition, I discovered that I could get what I wanted from pretty nearly everyone I met, young and old. This is in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, you wouldn't think that that was something that would be said 100 years ago, because it feels like the kind of thing we're saying now. But um, you know, he felt that he wasn't getting the old traditions in the way that he could in the States. And I, I did a, my first field recording trip to BBC was in, in North Carolina and Georgia, uh, trying to follow these steps, and I'll talk about it in a bit, but just trying to get back to those earlier memories that might go back to the foreground and, and the record player changed things. Hugh Tracy was another ethnomusicologist. Uh, well, actually, he went out to work on the family farm in southern Rhodesia after World War I as well. He fell in love with Karanga music and his first recordings uh, were made in the early 30s. Um, he struggled to find support for his work from back home, so he ended up broadcasting um, South African radio. Uh, and uh, he was director of the Durban Broadcasting Studios. Uh, he introduced the first local broadcasting African language in South Africa. Um, and in 47, he realised that he needed some sort of framework around his African music collection, and he founded the African Music Society. Um, he got money, interesting, he got money from record label Gallo, but also from the Nuffield Foundation and Ford, so they were even putting money into, into food recording at this time. Um, this is Edward Evans Pritchard, um, and this actually comes from the uh, Pitt Rivers Museum, where they have a huge collection of food recordings. This is a Zande Warsaw.
audience is something we'll talk about later, but, but you know, for me, I've been a radio producer, so I want people to be able to enjoy it as well as research it. Back then, there wasn't really an option. That's what you've got. That was 1928 in South Sudan. Uh, Sunday night, I did what I said. Um, Technology is an interesting thing because it allowed the recorders to go beyond Cecil Sharp um, and record the signals that you heard. It's not cheap though, so that institutional framework was really important. Um, you know, 1911, the HMV, the Gramophone Company of London, were a record company operating in West Africa. In 27, the Gold Coast market opened up and Sonophone EMI and later the Deputy Yellow were, were recording local music and operating commercially. Um, 1928, the Archive of American Folk Song was set up. Um, with Robert W. Gordon and they said, I think this is interesting, collecting must be done in a scholarly manner and the collection safeguarded against improper use should be made freely accessible to scholars. Um, which, you know, again, that was 1928, but I think those words are really useful for us now as we think about access, the ethics of digital archives, what that means. So, guarding against them, safeguarding against improper use, you know, important then as it is now, um, or now as it was then. Um, BBC was, Sorry about that. Um, well, you maybe won't see the picture of Peter Kennedy. But um, the, the BBC was commissioning recordings from around the world um, in tandem with ethnomusicologists and field recordings, recordists, and um, it was mainly to provide material for program makers. So there's a lot of in the BBC archives, there's a lot of kind of imperial content so they could illustrate new stories. Um, by the 50s, you've got the magnetic tape recorder and Ewan McCall, Bert Lloyd, Alan Lomax, Brunkel Ballads and Blues, Ballads and Blues um, was you know, part of that traditional music revival here. Um, and Peter Kennedy's As I Rode Down was another um, series of playing traditional music field recording. So those, the idea of field recording as a broadcast medium was coming into, into effect then in the 50s. Um, you can hear this. This is a Peter Kennedy recording. Let's play it up there. Uh, from my father. Um, all the old men about, and every man of them was a hundred years before they died. That's a strange thing to you. I am, I'm ninety one at, at Halloween next month, October. No, November. I'm ninety. Well, uh, Will you sing one of the Eh? Will you sing one of the forests? And Charlie did come down, Miss. Charlie come down, Miss. Oh, I can't have my tongue like that, but then, Miss. That mother, you and me. Mother, you and me. What you'll have to Where was that? The British Library Sound Office. No, 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 where was that? 
Oh, yes. that was in um, that was in the middle there, Donny Gall. Um, so that was that was what was happening in the UK in the fifties. In France, France had a very different approach to uh, kind of colonial territories in the fifties. While the British were encouraging local language broadcasting, um, the French in fifty five, the French set up the Société de Radio Diffusion de la France de um, Sorafont. Uh, which they founded to create radio networks in the French colonies in French. Um, and it interesting, it was run by um, Pierre Schaeffer, who's also the father of Louis um, And he was training local African engineers. Um, and then that transmuted into the, uh, the office of Corporation, sorry for my French, Corporation Radiophonique, um, Cora, uh, which started to preserve traditional music in recorded form and, um, and set out a whole bunch of records. So you probably have some. Or a reference if you have. Um, it's another interesting archive of, of traditional music. Um, you know, this thing about money is, is really interesting. If you look through Jean Jenkins' archives at the National Museum of Scotland, you find that she's constantly trying to get cash to go places, you know, including right to Haile Selassie saying, you know, I really want to come, can you give me some cash? Um, so it's a tricky thing. By the 80s, world music as a genre has kicked in. You know, Charlie Gillett, Andy Kershaw are playing commercially recorded traditional music on the radio. Um, radio Theatre had a whole series of full ethnic music programmes on the full week. And, um, and then the 10th century sort of world groups begin. That's kind of ethnic background there. Um, the, the shift to sound collecting by recording um, is this thing about creating an intervention into old, centuries old oral traditions. Um, ballads were passed, when I was in North Carolina, people were telling me ballads were passed from knee to knee. Okay, so that's mother and daughter sitting knee to knee in the song being transferred. Um, but now they can be learned from recording, of course. Um, in an oral tradition, the quirks of memory transmute the source material into a new originality that's passed along. Um, and now we have authentic recordings for our source material. So are these new processes of collection, are they frozen ancient oral traditions, or are we now just better informed about what these to be? Um, and so just a quick example. Um, so this is what, as, as Ben says, this in the late um, Surrey County Fiddle, the Mount Airy Fiddle Convention. Um, a very big camp. He used to play his fiddle with just two fingers. Um, use any other ones because his hands were so big. Um, but I want to play you a tune I recorded uh, in Mount Airy by a singer called Elizabeth Frell. Um, I'll let her introduce it. Mr. Amateur, look, Matt. Uh, so, I'm Elizabeth LaPrell, um, I'm from Rural Retreat, Virginia, and uh, I'm going to sing uh, Hop Old Rabbit, which is uh, from the singing of Horton Barker from Chihuahua, Virginia. Yonder comes the little man riding by, says, old man, your horse will die. Hop, 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 old rabbit, hop. Well, if he dies, I'll tan his skin, but if he lives, I'll ride him again. Hop, 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 old rabbit hop. If he dies, it's no big loss, but if he lives, he's my old hops. Hop, 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 old rabbit hop. Oh, Mr. Rabbit, you look mighty thin. Yes, my lord, I'm splitting the wind. Hop, 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 old rabbit hop. Oh, Mr. Abbott, your ears are mighty long. Well, yes, my lord, they're put on wrong. Hop, 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 old rabbit hop. Oh, Mr. Abbott, you look mighty brave. Yes, my lord, I'm hunting the cave. Hop, 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 old rabbit hop. Oh, Mr. Abbott, you got a bad habit of getting in the garden and eating all the cabbage. Hop, 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 old rabbit hop. I'll get old Jack and put him on the track and ride that rabbit to thunder and back. Hop, 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 old rabbit hop. That's crazy. That's crazy. She's an incredible voice. So she's, that was recorded three or four years ago, I think. She's worth tracking down if you like. Elizabeth Lefrell. Um, she said at the beginning she credits her version to the singer of Horton Barker from Chilhowee, Virginia. He was a blind singer, he was approached in the 1930s by um, song collectors. 37 he was recorded by Lomax. So this is him singing the same song. So this is where her version came from. 
Yonder comes a little man riding by and says, Old man, your horse will die. Hop, 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 poor rabbit hog. If he dies, I'll tan his skin, but if he lives, I'll ride him again. Hop, 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 poor rabbit hog. If he dies, it's no big loss, but if he lives, he's my old horse. Hop, 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 poor rabbit hog. Oh, Mr. Rabbit, you look mighty brave, but yes, my lord, I'm hunting a cave. Hop, 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 old rabbit hog. Oh, Mr. Rabbit, your ears are mighty long, yes, my lord, they're put on wrong. Hop, 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 old rabbit hog. Oh, Mr. Rabbit, you look mighty thin, yes, my lord, I'm splitting the wind. Hop, 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 old rabbit hog. Oh, Mr. Rabbit, you look mighty brave, but yes, my lord, I'm hunting a cave. Hop, 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 old rabbit hog. Oh, Mr. Rabbit, you got a bad habit of getting in the garden and eating up the cabbage. Hop, 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 old rabbit hog. I'll get old Jack and put him on the track and run that rabbit to thunder and back. Hop, 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 old rabbit hog. They're quite different versions. That, that, that split in her voice is typical of the ballad singers. I think she, she learned to think she Sheila Adams, um, who comes from a, a family of ballad singers who sing, sing child ballads uh, around Mars Creek in the, in the Blue Ridge. So her singing style is very similar to the, the, that school of ballad singing. Horton Market didn't have that, and he had quite a sweet tone of voice. Um, is there a technical name for that? There probably is, and I'm not sure. So I think what's really interesting is we're not really sure the, you know, what the current reality of this song is. Um, it was a plantation song, so you know, we don't know where it's from. Um, but through the recordings, we've fixed it for the last 50 years. So where is, what, you know, where is authenticity? Where is originality of the song? Does it really matter? So, will everyone now learn the Horton Barker version of the song? Because that's the first one that entered the recorded catalog. So you know, how does time, how does tradition play? That's just, just a cursory example of the nature of what recording does to tradition. Um, and American folk music is quite interesting because it has a relatively short history. It's already passed through the filter of the radio, the gramophone, at least two revivals. Um, so this idea of authenticity is quite familiar. But it's, uh, I think the nature of collecting it still has value. Um, so that's the that Uncle Reed's collection. Um, this is Joe Thompson, who was uh, a black fiddler in North Carolina, um, who I recorded in the when he was in his 90s, he died last year. Um, he was recognized as one of the few remaining black string band players in the American South, um, and he's been recorded throughout his lifetime. Um, but just to play this, because it really stuck with him, this was a moment of reminiscence from him about his childhood. And the reason I was there was to try and get these old guys in the 90s, because they must have learned their songs from people who didn't grow up with the radio the ground. Possibly. But they were the last ones who certainly you, know, you could make that song. This is a very special thing. All of a vessel. My mama was an old primitive Baptist. You get to a primitive Baptist church? A primitive Baptist. What does that mean? That's an old tune. I like my church where I belong to a missionary Baptist. Okay. My mama, she could have sang that little song. She'd be out there in the garden picking beans. Everybody be in the field, and me and mama be over there in the garden picking beans. Cook for them. 
and she sang your song, man, just it so happened. That's how long I've been here. That's been a long time ago. Okay. My mama was young, and I'm 90 years old. Now you can figure out how long ago that's been. I got oil in my vessel, my lamp trembling, burning, robed and ready, waiting for the bride and groom to come.